All right, good morning again. Great to see you all. If you were here last night, great to see you again already. How many were here last night? Okay, and those of you that weren't, uh, why not? (laughs) Kidding. (laughs) Kidding. Really, really fun to be back, and I want to jump right into this because I have a little bit to share with you. GPS 1.0 is the title of my talk today. How many of us have had opportunity to use a GPS ever? So pretty much everybody. And it's great when it works, isn't it? When it's working, it gets us where we want to go. It's so easy and fun. But is there anybody here besides me who ever feels a little bit overwhelmed at the pace of change of technology? Like sometimes it's kind of hard to keep up. Okay, here's a song for you. I was working online, I was talking on Bluetooth, downloading songs, checking email on Yahoo, texting my friends, I tweeted 20 new tweets. On Facebook my brain began to overheat. My new tablet high def digital camera wouldn't sync up with my printer fax scanner. The tech support guy started yakking away, lost in translation all the way from Bombay. I had to break out of this techno mood. I needed something primal like a big hunk of food. For a nano moment, I forgot where it is, so I googled directions from my den to my fridge. I was so fried, I wondered how much bandwidth it would take for my iPod to download a sandwich. And deep in my hard drive, a feeling took root. My brain just might crash if I didn't reboot. All this hyper technology is streaming me crazy. I've picked up a virus called Cyberspacey. The neurotransmitters in my cerebellum Making gray matter and chatter But nothing is gelling These gizmos and gigabytes are geeking me out Single tasking is obsolete now I need to slow down My life is a blur I got an analog brain in a digital world I jumped in my hybrid, turned on satellite radio, strapped on my hands free and fired up my sat phone. Almost backed over my mom on her Segway. Dashboard lit up, said I was low on latte. Where was Starbucks? I can only guess. My PDA can't do GPS. I stopped for directions and wandered in here and wound up singing to you. Isn't that weird? All this hyper technology streaming me crazy. I've picked up a virus called Cyberspacey. The neurotransmitters in my cerebellum making gray matter chatter, but nothing is jelly. These gizmos and gigabytes are geeking me out. Single tasking is obsolete now. I need to slow down. My life is a blur. I got an analog brain in a digital world. Thank you. Can be a little overwhelming at times. All the, all the technology. Uh, who knows what, well, let me, let me say this first. One of the points of that song, which we're going to get into a little bit later, is the fact that multitasking is actually not efficient and, it, and makes us less happy or even unhappy. Multitasking just doesn't work. So we're going to just park that thought for a minute because we're going to come back to it. Who knows what GPS stands for? Say it. Global Positioning System, right. But for our purposes today, John, it stands for Guidance Provided by Spirit. (laughs) And you know what? It's a free service. It's not even an option. Comes pre-installed in the package. 
No special download is required. It's just a standard part of the package when we're born. The only thing is you have to know how to turn it on and use it. And for the longest time, I had no idea that it even existed. So I want to tell you just a little bit about this, how I came to not only find out about guidance, but actually feel like I, I kind of can use it whenever I want to. So in the late 1980s, I was living in Nashville writing songs, working as a, a songwriter, and I had been paying my dues for several years, working hard, meeting people, writing songs, and I started to have a few songs in the pipeline, and finally I got offered this great contract from a music publisher to be a staff songwriter. So this is what you want. You want people to pay you for writing songs. This is your goal. They have money invested in you, so they're going to pitch your songs. They're going to try to make you successful. So this is a real primo thing to be offered. Not only that, it was a good contract. It was good money involved. Well, at the exact same time, like within 24 hours, I got from way out of left field, this crazy offer landed in my lap to go to the Caribbean and sing in a posh resort for six months. Made no sense to consider that. I, there was no point. I, not what I was working for. I was working for being a songwriter. But for reasons I just couldn't understand, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I just couldn't stop thinking about it. Finally, I went after a week, I went to my publisher and I said, look, I know this is crazy. You've offered me this great contract. It's fantastic. It's what I want. But I've got this offer to go to the Caribbean. I can't stop thinking about it. He said, ah. He was kind of a smart guy, this guy. He was actually a psychologist before he was a publisher. And he said, well, why don't you just go down there to the Caribbean? It's only six months. You can write for me down there, but I won't start paying you till you come back. Great, problem solved, so off I go to the Caribbean, and I had no idea why until about three weeks later when I found myself one Sunday afternoon lying on the beach in the sun, and it came to me why I was in the Caribbean. I had this overwhelming sense of relief at being away from the music business. I realized with great shock that I was tired of some things. I was tired of the competition. It's really intense competition. Even though it's friendly, there's only so many songs that are going to be hits, and there's millions more that get written. Not millions, but thousands. I was tired of the schmoozing, having to be politically friendly with people that you might not otherwise care about at all or even like. So I was tired of the schmoozing. I was tired of the creative restrictions of having to write for country music radio. You know, words with less than two syllables, things like that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's not that bad. But you've heard, I like to do some off-the-wall stuff, and Garth Brooks is not going to record that song. <laughs> not going to happen. So I'm getting in touch with this. The fact that I have this relief about being away from that, and also getting in touch with the fact that I like performing. I've gotten back into singing and playing at this resort. It's the Hyatt Regency Grand Cayman. And I'm singing five hours a night, six nights a week, which is a lot. We'll come back to that. Now, the, I don't know if you've ever been down there uh, to Grand Cayman or the Hyatt, which doesn't exist anymore, but you've probably seen it in the movie, the Tom Cruise movie, The Firm, about 30 years ago, he plays a mafia lawyer who doesn't know he's a mafia lawyer until it's too late and he can't get out of the firm. Toward the end of that movie, there's a scene with Gene Hackman and the actress that plays Tom Cruise's wife, and they're together at a poolside bar in the Caribbean. Well, that's the Hyatt Grand Cayman. And in the back of that scene, there's a guy singing and playing guitar. And it's not me. <laughs> But it's my friend James who took my spot when I left and got to be in the movie. That's what I was doing, singing by the pool sidebar for two hours. Then I would move over to the restaurant, sing for another three hours, and that was my job every day, plus set up, take down, six days a week. 
So what I discovered after a few weeks and months of this was that people come to the Caribbean for a certain kind of experience, and they'd like their music to reflect that experience. So what they want to hear and what I have to play is mostly island-type music. So this is reggae, this is calypso, and lots and lots of Jimmy Buffett songs. <laughs> all of which is great music, I love it all, but after a few days, a few weeks, playing these same songs over and over again, the next guy that wants to hear Margaritaville, you just kinda wanna shoot him. <laughs> So this, this is going on, and, and the weeks and months go by, and finally I've been there six months, and two things happen. The Hyatt management, they come to me, and they say, we like what you're doing, we'd like to extend your contract for an extra year. I get a call from Nashville, my publisher has lost his financing. He can't pay me if I come back. All this happened again, like the same 24 hour span. So I told the people at the Hyatt I would stick around. I mean, I wasn't crazy about the idea of doing these same songs for another year, but they were paying me well, and I thought if, if I go back I'll have a, in a year, I'll have a nest egg, a pretty substantial nest egg, so I won't feel pressure to work some job I didn't want. Anyway, so I signed up for another year. Well, coincidentally, except not really, I started having some very, very serious mental and emotional trauma right after that. It's a long story, it's kind of complicated, but you need to know it was horrible. It was a lot of, it was kind of a dissociative psychotic thing that you couldn't tell was happening to me, but I could tell it was happening on the inside. And so it was a lot of despair, a lot of fear every day, all day. And there was no real help down there on that little island. There wasn't much of a medical community. I didn't want to quit. I didn't want to back out on my contract. So every day I would just kind of gut it out for another day. And then that night, a lot of nights, I'd just lie there praying all night for help, just praying. So another six months goes by, and this is what life is like for me every day. And fate intervenes in the form of the first Persian Gulf War, Desert Storm, 1991, January and the recession that hit about the same time. The management at the Hyatt felt that tourism was going to really slack off, so they started laying people off. And I was the junior musician, so I got downsized. Anybody else have <laughs> been downsized know what that's like? Yeah, I don't know your response, but my response, again, overwhelming relief. Thank you, God. I can go home and get help. That was my thought. I can go home and get help. The next day, the guy that owns the place next door to the Hyatt, called the Lone Star Bar and Grill, <laughs> comes to see me. He said, I heard you got laid off. I said, yeah? He said, well, listen, I want some music in the Lone Star. I'd like to hire you. Now, the idea of playing music at the Lone Star Bar and Grill was nothing short of well, scary, you know, just... <laughs> At least at the Hyatt, people were quiet. Frequently in the afternoon by the pool, they were sleeping. The Lone Star would be the exact opposite. It's just what it sounds like. It's a large, noisy Tex-Mex beer bar, and if you're out scuba diving all day and you want to go knock back a few beers or something and you know, let off some steam, it's a great place to go, decent food. But to play music for that environment would be horrible. No part of me wanted to go do that, but I liked this guy. I didn't want to tell him that. So I said, Mike, you know, that's really nice of you, but, you know, I'm really burnt out on six nights a week. And, and he, he says, oh, no, that's okay. You could just do four nights. Well, okay, that would be better, but, you know, I really can't do five hours a night anymore. It's just too hard. He said, okay, how about three hours? I said, well, that would be a lot better, but, you know, it's really expensive on this island. I, I would have to have a lot of money. And he said, I'll pay you. <laughs> so I'm thinking, what is going on here? I don't want to do this. I'm trying to be nice about it. And, and he, he just really wants me to do it. Finally, I said, Mike, I just can't. I've got to take a break. I'm really suffering from burnout. He said, go home. Take some time off. Come back in six weeks. Spring break. Perfect time to start. I'm so confused. I'm like, well, okay, if I go home and, 
and don't come back. I don't know what I'm going to do for money or anything else. I don't even know where I'm going to live. If I come back, at least I've got a paycheck. So I told him I would come back, not feeling great about it. The next day, very next day, I'm on my island scooter that they tell you never to ride because they're dangerous. And they are. <laughs> and I hit a pothole at 15 miles an hour, flipped over the handlebars, bounced on the pavement, got up, and I was kind of scratched and bruised, but, you know, no big deal. I was, I was going to be okay. So, uh, so the day after that, I'm on the plane, and I go to Nashville where my clothes are, where all my stuff is in storage, where my car is. And so I do a business for about a week. I see people. I pitch some songs. I get my winter clothes out of storage, get my car, and I drive home to Kansas City where my parents live. They're gone for the winter. I can use their home. The first morning I'm in Kansas City, I wake up at 6 o'clock with pain in my gut that I have never experienced before. It's like indescribable pain. I can barely move in the bed. I reach over, pick up the phone, I call my sister, and I ask her if they're sick, because I had dinner at her house the night before. Are you guys sick over there? No, we're fine. Okay. My brother comes over, takes me to the emergency room. They do a CAT scan, and they say, hey, you're in trouble. Your spleen's ruptured. You're full of blood. You've got to check in right now. We have to immobilize you. Your life is actually in danger. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm strapped in there for a couple, three, four days in the bed, you know, not moving. It hurts to breathe. It hurts to laugh. It hurts to sneeze, cough. Really hurts. And then they do another CAT scan. And then these two doctors come by, these two surgeons. And it turns out I knew these guys. I'd gone to school, all the way through school, through school with them. There's these two doctors, brothers, these two brothers. And they came to see me. They said, hey, we looked at your CAT scan. And, you know, you've stopped bleeding. You're still full of blood. Your spleen's still in, in bad shape, very dangerous. And normally what we do is we just open you up and we take it out. We just remove it. But before we do that, we thought we'd ask you if you'd like to keep yours. I said, yeah, I vote for that. They said, okay, well, if you want to try to keep it, that's fine. We're going to let you go home, but you're going to have to really, really take it easy. No effort, no, no lifting, no work, no physical work. You can maybe drive a car, but don't move fast. Just be very, very careful for, a, for as long as it takes. And, and I said, no problem. I can do that. And I thought they meant a couple of weeks, but it turned out they, that it took months for this pain to go away. So here's what, what happens. Because I'm in all this physical pain and I can't go back to the Caribbean, I just don't go. I call him every week and I say, well, maybe next week, but I'm not coming this week. Meanwhile, I'm doing everything I can to get, to get help for this nightmare in my head, this black hole of despair and fear and terror. I'm getting counseling. I'm healing some relationships that need to be healed. I'm reading everything I can get my hands on. I've gotten back into 12-step work. I'm participating in all kinds of little healing groups. And because I'm doing all of this, new songs are coming up. These are not Nashville love songs. These are songs about healing, big love, universal love, spiritual songs, songs I've never really written before. And because I'm participating in various kinds of groups, playing for like cancer support groups, recovery groups, things like that, just because I'm part of this community, people hear these new songs and I start getting invited to perform at, at real venues like medical conferences and corporate stress and wellness events and recovery conferences and churches. Me, performing in a church, no one would have ever thought that, especially me. So, bottom line is, this is my new career, and I've been getting away with it for the last 30 years. But here's the thing, 
I mean, looking back on this, the lesson is so clear. If I had been better at being myself, at being who I am, at acknowledging the kind of relationships and, and community and environment I need to be in, the kind of people I need to be around, the kind of things I need to be reading and listening to, if I had been better at being my own vulnerable person, personality, I could have maybe skipped all the trauma and gotten to the same place. I mean, I got, when I got laid off at the Hyatt, I got this loud and clear message from my heart. Unmistakable. Go home. Get help. Just get help. Couldn't miss it. And here was this test from the guy at the Lone Star. And because I couldn't listen to my heart, my spleen got me home and kept me there for as long as it took. Now that might sound silly, but that's what happened. Bernie Siegel talks about this in his books about cancer recovery. The great surgeon, Bernie Siegel, he says he believes everyone comes into life with a path. And if we start to get off our path, we become psychologically or spiritually troubled. And if we ignore that, we become physically ill. Well, I don't think this explains every kind of physical illness. I don't believe that, but I, I do think it's what happened to me. Has anybody else had to get the cosmic two by four to get your attention? <laughs> yeah, you know what that is? That's the inner GPS working. That's what it is. See, it's always working. Even if we don't know it exists, even if we don't know it's there, it's always working. And eventually, it's going to find a way to get our attention. Have you rented a car from Hertz? Do you know what their GPS system is? Remember what it's called? Never lost. <laughs> Isn't that a great name? Never lost? I feel like we truly are never lost. We might feel lost, horribly, hopelessly lost, but I feel like we are truly never lost. Now, it's interesting because this inner GPS, this analog, so to speak, GPS, has some similarities with the digital GPS. You know, for, for them to work, we actually have to turn them on, right? There's an on button. You have to open the app or turn on the, the GPS in the car. But with our inner GPS, the on button is usually the quiet button, usually marked quiet. Get quiet. Well, this is not normal for us. We're not taught that in this country. It's not a normal cultural value or virtue. This is why we need to come places like uh, Unity of Cape Cod and congregate with other abnormal people. <laughs> because what's normal in our culture is not always healthy. So the quiet button is important because normally what we're doing is multitasking. We're busy in what I called last night the U.S. of stress or the excited states of America. This is where we live. <laughs> So it's important to learn how to get quiet and then to listen. So once we turn it on, we have to get a signal, right? With a digital GPS, we have to get a satellite signal. It's kind of the same with our inner GPS. We have to get a signal. We have to, we have to feel something. So it's usually a feeling. It's usually an emotion. Ideally, it's joy. That's what gets our attention is, is joy. Now, if you're like me, if you're slow but trainable, it could be relief. It could be a big feeling of relief. Just, just try this with me. Just take a nice big deep breath. And imagine you just found out something horrible you thought was going to happen is not going to happen. Oh, wow. What a feeling of relief that is. Well, that gets your attention. If you're in your life, you're doing your life, and you get that about some big decision, some big event, that should get your attention, relief. All right, then we have to have some idea where we want to go. If we have a digital GPS, we enter the destination, right? And that tells it to start working. So it's kind of the same with our life. We need to have some idea what we want, where we want to go, because it gets us up gets us in motion, gets us moving. 
The difference is, oh, and then we have a choice of routes, right? If the GPS always gives us the fast route, the construction route, the slow route, the no tolls, the high tolls, you know, we have these choices of how we want to get there. It's kind of the same in our life. You know, we can take the, the rocky road or we can take a, an easier road. If we can see it clearly, we can choose. But the main thing is, and the big difference is, we have to give up control of the destination. We have to give up control of the outcome. This is hard for us as Westerners because we're so trained to focus on that goal and achieve it and then achieve another one and another one and another one. This is how we're trained. But the problem with that is if we really focus on only one goal, we might not see what God has out here on the other roads that might even be better for us that we never could have imagined. The Dalai Lama talks about this. He says, I am open to the guidance of synchronicity, but I am always in touch with what my heart needs and leads me to. There's also a theologian, Howard Thurman, who says, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, what we feel in our hearts and where it leads us is the most important thing we can ever learn because if we don't, all our lives we will be dancing at the ends of strings pulled by somebody else. So that's GPS 1.0, inner guidance provided by spirit. Now, sometimes, if you're like me and you end up taking the rocky road, it's good, it's helpful, To have an excuse. So, let me share with you my favorite excuse. Last spring I met this cute girl and I just felt so confused. I knew I needed special help Show me what to do So I closed my mind and caught Closed my eyes and calmed my mind And in peaceful bliss I tried To get in touch with my own inner spirit guide Named Clyde I chanted out a mantra And in a minute there he was a little guy who needed a bath, a face with three-day fuzz. He told me, son, be aggressive if you want to win her heart. So the next day, I just stole a kiss. She slapped me really hard. Oh, Clyde, oh, Clyde, my inner guy. Why do I get this feeling that you like? Soon after that I came upon a surefire get-rich scheme My broker said that poor crypto was the key to all my dreams So I consulted Clyde to see if this was the right time He said yes and by the next week I lost every dime Oh Clyde, oh Clyde My inner guide Why do I get this feeling that you like? I was starting to suspect that Clyde was underhanded So I confronted him Despite this fear of being abandoned that you're supposed to learn to trust your inner self But what if he turns out to be evil little elf I told him I was angry and I felt betrayed and hurt And he just sat there and smiled at me and giggled and then he burped Then he just laughed right out loud and his 
breath is really stunk. When I saw those bloodshot eyes, I knew it. He was drunk. It hit me like a freight train. All my life things had gone wrong. And all because my inner guide was drinking all along. I should have seen it years ago in that lopsided smile. But I guess all this time I've been in inner guy denial. So that's when I tried an intervention. Things got really hot. Clyde swore he didn't have a problem. And then he offered me some pot. But finally I got through to Clyde and he said, you know, there's a lot of us. And so he went and started his own little chapter of Inner Guides Anonymous. Clyde says that in the meetings, they just complain about what they're doing. They say, what's the point of being sober when you're inside a screwed up human? Well, Clyde, he struggles with sobriety. And I pray he holds on to it. Because every time he falls off the wagon, I do something stupid. Oh, Clyde, oh, Clyde, my inner guy. Why do I get this feeling? We can make it if we try. You have been watching the message from our Sunday celebration service here at Unity on Cape Cod, providing a positive path for spiritual living. Please join us every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. at 147 Walton Ave, Hyannis Mass, and visit us online at unityoncapecod.org. This video was made possible in part through a grant from Unity Worldwide Ministries and the Templeton Foundation.